you know, it's just, uh, it's just interesting. We're in this new series called The Blessed Life. I preach this series every year since 2012. Every year in November, I preach this series. And it's interesting because um, a, a lot of you have come to know it as a stewardship series. And it is. But the reality is it's stewardship beyond what we think it is. It's not just about finances. It's not just about stewardship financially. It's more than that. It's bigger than that. And in 2015, I, wanna, I want us to dig deeper still into what God has for us in his word as it pertains to living this life and the desire that it would be a blessed life. You know, and immediately when I say that, that word blessed has a lot of different meanings, doesn't it? We tend to think when we say a blessed life that we mean a financially secure and strong life. Well, if, if, um, if that were true, <laughs> then my, many of us would probably would start scratching our heads. So I want you to turn with me to Luke 19. We're going to start with a familiar story. Page 801 in your pew Bible, and we're going to be jumping around a lot in the Word, so be prepared. We're going to do a little Scripture Kung Fu this morning. And, uh, you know, Scripture Kung Fu, it's the, whoa, we're going to go here and go there and, and everywhere. As you're turning there to Luke 19, I, I want to read this uh, passage to you out of Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 35 says, You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed, there's that word, to give than to receive. This is Paul talking, Luke recording. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That word blessed in the Greek here is makarios. Everybody say makarios. Makarios means happy or happier or full of joy. So if we look at the passage of Scripture in Acts 20, he's literally saying that remember what Jesus says, it is more happy it is more full of joy. You'll be happier if you give more than you receive. And the, the truth is, many of us, I think if I took a poll and said, do you remember the last time that you gave or the last time that you even served, served th or gave through serving, you would say, wow, it was an incredible experience and it was rewarding. Many of you could say this morning, you've been on a mission trip where you've given a lot and I'm, I'm, I don't want to jump ahead. I'm going to steal my own sermon point. Um, but you've, you've, you've gone to a place and you come home and your response is, I was more blessed. I came home more blessed, even in my giving. So Paul's reminding us, remember the words that Jesus taught, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, most recently in my preaching, we've been adding these, uh, these, these things called the bottom line. Basically, the bottom line is a sermon. It's the sermon in one sentence. So if anybody asks you, what did pastor preach on last week? Just quote the bottom line, right? And it's intentional. It's to help us. Well, the bottom line this morning is, is it's a kind of a remembering. It's a remembering. Look at the bottom line with me. God won't ask you to give something that he hasn't given first. That's a great reminder. God won't ask you to give something he hasn't given first. Whatever it is that we feel like that we're being challenged with, whatever it is it feel like that God is, is challenging us to give, we always have to remember that he gave it first. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what he's asking you to give. He's always given it first. What a great reminder this morning. So Luke 19, it's a familiar story. It's the story of Zacchaeus. And we all know that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, Right? And a wee little man was he. Keep going. What did he do? Climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Right? What happened next? Yeah, Z he said, Zacchaeus, you come down here. That's my favorite part. Anybody else, that's your favorite part? Because it's like, usually you shout that. You know, Zacchaeus, you come down here. Right? Because what does the Lord say? For your house I'm going to today right? Right? We all know the story, so we're going to pick it up, and we're going to look at it, the biblical, scriptural side of it. Verse 7, but the people, or in other translations, all the people were displeased 
He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Now, now, what's interesting here is we just stop and pause in verse 7 right there. A lot of times when you see Jesus doing things for sinners, who is it that's complaining the most? The Pharisees or the Sadducees, the religious leaders. They're the ones that are like, I cannot believe he is going to hang out with tax collectors, different, <laughs> different set of, uh, of um, circumstances there, and sinners. And then on this one, though, we have to be reminded that it wasn't, the tax, it wasn't the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were complaining that he was going to eat a meal with a notorious sinner. Not just a sinner, a notorious sinner. But it was all the people in the town. So Jesus looks up and he sees Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, you come down here. I'm going to your house. And all the people that were, that were around that moment they were grumbling and complaining. He's going to eat a meal with a notorious sinner. Wow, what a reputation. So, verse 8, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. Now, what's interesting here is that there was a, something happened between verse 7 and verse 8. Something happened. You see, between verse 7 and verse 8, verse 7, the people were complaining because he's going to eat dinner. Well, guess what? Between verse 7 and verse 8, that meal happened. Zacchaeus sat down with Jesus and had, a, and had a meal with him. And just like when we come in contact with Jesus, crazy things occur. Lives are changed. Transformation is experienced. And that's exactly what happens here between verse 7 and verse 8. Because Zacchaeus had an encounter with the holy living Lord, he changed everything about who he was. And, and, and he responded. In fact, there's two things that I want to point out. It's the action and the attitude of Zacchaeus. So when we look at the action part of this in, in this scripture, what was the action that Zacchaeus took? He said, listen, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. That was the action portion of what Zacchaeus, how he responded to that meal with the Lord. Because again, Zacchaeus responded to his relationship with God and with Jesus in that moment. He had a meal with him. And he was changed. And the attitude part of that is that he was going to give fourfold to anyone that he owed. If he cheated anybody, he was going to pay it back four times. Now we think, wow, four times, that's, that's, wow, that's pretty impressive. Well, actually, it is. Because it was customary during this time that if you owed somebody, you restored the amount plus 20%. That's what was customary. So Zacchaeus is saying, listen, I know what is customary, but I don't even care about that. I'm going to pay back four times what I owe to anybody. And why is he doing that again? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's because he just had an encounter with the living Lord. It's because he just sat down and had a meal and something happened. A light bulb came on. He was radically changed because of this encounter with Jesus. Think back to the time when you had an encounter with Jesus. Were you not radically changed? Sometimes we get so far away from that transformation moment that we begin to wane a little bit in the power of that moment and what we desire to do for the Lord, don't we? And it's okay. I'm not picking on anybody or beating anybody up. It's just the reality of life, isn't it? But Zacchaeus, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. He's a new creature in the Lord. He has a meal with Jesus, and all of a sudden he gets up and he says, I'm going to give 50% of everything I have to the poor. Do you think Jesus was like, whoa, Zacchaeus, let's hold on here. Let's hold on. You know, because you're a wealthy man. No. Jesus is probably sitting there going, yes, yes, Zacchaeus, yes. And then Zacchaeus says, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to even do one better. If I've, if I've cheated anybody, which, by the way, the, the scripture alludes to the fact, and, and scholars believe that he cheated everybody. It, he would, it wasn't just like a list of uh, one or two people, and they're standing in line going, hey, remember that time you cheated me? The whole town is going to be standing at his door because he cheated everybody. 
But because he came into an encounter with the living Lord, he was radically changed. He says, listen, I'm not just going to do the customary thing and pay back what I owe plus 20%. I'm going to pay back four times whatever it is I owe them. Folks, guess what? At the end of all of this, Zacchaeus, he's a changed man. He is not the same person. I bet you if he climbs up in a sycamore tree again, and if Jesus was to come back, people wouldn't grumble and say, he's going to eat with a notorious sinner. People would look at Zacchaeus and say, he's going to eat with a man who has been radically transformed by the message of Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of people believe that giving, or or I believe, sorry, that giving is the action of the Bible. Some would say that it's love. There, you know, there's not an argument. We're not going to argue about it. You know, some would say that love is the action of the Bible. But I would actually say that giving is the action of the Bible. You see, the reason I don't believe that love is the action of the Bible is because God is love. Love is not something that God does. Love is something that God is. So then what does God do? Well, then let's look at the action of what God does while God gives Take the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. It was because of God's love that he gave. Are we, are we tracking? Are we tracking? I need like an amen corner, Right? I, I just need a section of folks that are going to amen me and, and that, that I feel like, okay, they're getting it. We can keep going. Romans 8.32, another great example. Since he did not spare even his own son, but, say it with me, gave him up for, his, for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Thank you, church. I'm preaching now. It, it's the truth. He didn't even spare his own son. Why would he spare anything on you? Now, now, granted, church, we have to remember there's a difference between what we want and what we need. He's not just going to give us some, you know, sometimes he gives us, he he always gives us what, what we need. And sometimes he gives us what we want, too. But guess what? It flows out of obedience to him. It flows out of faithful obedience to him. Let's be reminded by the bottom line again. God won't ask you to give something that he hasn't given first. God won't ask you to give something that he hasn't given first. We're here this morning because God gave. You are sitting in this pew this morning because God gave. The first thing that he gave was his son. We're here because Jesus gave his life for us. We gave our lives to God. That's another reason why we're here, because we gave our lives to God. And and the truth is, we gave our morning, this morning, to God. That's why we're here. So we're here as a result of giving, whether we're giving time, whether we're giving resources, whether we're giving our lives. It's all in an act of giving. Marriage. Marriage is all about giving. Don't believe me? Just get married. It is. It's about giving. In order to have a successful marriage, it takes two people giving to each other, supporting one another. That's that's the, the, the marriage that is built on and predicated on two people giving of themselves to the other is, by definition, a successful marriage. Caring for one another. And so like I've already alluded to this morning, the blessed life is more than just about money. It is. It's more than just about money. It's about giving our lives. It's about giving our love to God. It's about giving everything that you have because he gave everything he has. That's what it's about. It's about us responding to the fact when we realize that God gave everything, the only result, the only response we have, the only reaction that we can give that will even come close to measuring of what God gave us is to give him everything back. This morning, if you're here and you haven't surrendered your life, you haven't given your life to Christ, guess what? It is the greatest gift that you can give God. 
You can't give him enough money. You can't give him enough time. You can't give him enough anything. Pick, pick whatever it is. But the one thing that you can give that outweighs everything else is your life. Because when you give your life, God dances. God dances. That's a gift that he gets excited about. See, God gave everything, and then we now live in response to that. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received, freely give. Well, let's talk about God's economy. God's economy is, it's, it's messed up, right? I mean, if you look at our economy, you thought our economy was bad? At least the first are first and the last are last, right? In our economy. But in God's economy, where's the first? They're the last. And who's the last? They're the first. So God's economy is messed up, right? Can we just all agree on that? I'm okay with it because when you understand the purposes behind it, boy, does it change your life. So when we look at God's economy, um, when it's been given to you, you give it away. In God's economy, that's the way that we ought to live. If it's been given to you, you give it away. Grace has been given to you, give it away. Mercy has been given to you, give it away. Forgiveness was offered to you, give it away. And, and then if we look at it, our finances are a gift from God. Anything given by God, we freely give. Now, now yeah, right? Wait, wait. It just got really, really quiet. Hey, folks, listen, it's okay. It's okay. This is an area of our spiritual journeys where we talk about, oh, I've received God's grace and I want to give it away. I've received God's mercy and I want to give it away. His forgiveness, I want to be able to forgive others. The peace of God that has been given to me, I want to offer that to the people around me. I've been given these incredible gifts of financial resources and I just really, whoa, wait a minute. Right? Right? This is the point that we have to start going deeper with God. Because I'm not standing up here as a, as a person that's just saying, you know, um, give it to the church. Right? God's not standing out there saying, give it back to me. I mean, we're talking about heaven, right? Heaven is the place where, where blacktop is gold. Think about that. The streets are paved with it. He's not hurting financially, folks. He doesn't ask you to give back to him because he needs it. He asks you to give back to him because you need it. He says, I don't want you to get caught up in all the mess that this stuff comes with, so give it to me and let me do something amazing with it. Many of you in your life have experienced God's provision. Oh, but why? But why? Because you faithfully, obediently have given back to him. He trusts you. He trusts you. See, giving is more than about money. But money is involved. It's included. Matthew 6, verse 19. I'm going to go ahead and have you, have you turn there. Page uh, 737 in your pew Bible. Matthew 6. And I'm just going to keep going here. Verse 19. It's amazing. Uh, I have to applaud the work of uh, Darren and Steve because each week they really diligently seek out and pray about the songs that we, uh, that we should worship each week. And uh, they didn't have my scripture. They only had um, a title. And the title of the message is Hilarious Giving. That's the title of the message, Hilarious Giving. I know you're kind of thinking, wow, I want to get to that part. So what do you do for that? How do you do a worship set centered around hilarious giving? <laughs> but what's amazing is God has met with us and has, and has led us through worship to where we're, where we're including where we're going to read. Verse 19, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures, or in other translations, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Folks, where's your treasure this morning? Where's your treasure? Is it, is it in your home? Is your treasure locked up in stocks? 
or maybe your retirement, or cars, maybe it's a hobby. If I was going to challenge you this morning, I would ask, where is your treasure? Think about it. Now again, none of those things are bad things until they become gold and silver in your life. None of those things are bad until they become the Lord of all. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, where's my treasure? Is there something in my life that I treasure more than I do my relationship with God? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. You know, because the, the reality is if you opened up my, my bank account and you looked at my, you know, debit receipts, you would find out that I treasure Starbucks. <laughs> you would find that out very quickly. You would see, whoa. <laughs> right? Now, granted, I've never been checked to think that if I, if I treasure Starbucks more than I treasure God, But what if God was challenging me to do something? What if he was challenging me obediently to to live or to sacrificially give? What if he was challenging my heart? Boy, would I not have to be challenged by the idea that maybe, just maybe, I'm holding back on what I can do for God because I drink too much coffee at Starbucks. Seriously. And I know what you're thinking now. You drink a lot of Starbucks. (laughs) But it's true. Just think about it. Allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you to go deeper into what God is revealing to us through his word. Don't store up for yourself treasure on earth, because guess what? You can't take it with you. I've never, I have never seen a hearse driving down the street with a U-Haul in tow. (laughs) Have you? You know, Egypt... Egypt, they used to bury their kings. The pyramids are gigantic tombs. Do you know they have rooms? They have treasure rooms in the, in the pyramids. And they used to take all the king's treasures and they used to put them inside the pyramid. Why? Because they believed that when the king died, the treasure would go with them. Guess what? Thousands of years later, they're still finding treasure. Do you know why? Because it didn't go with them. It can't go with them. Wherever it is that they went. (laughs) But you can't take it with you. I mean, I've heard pastors often misquote this passage. You maybe have heard it too. You've heard pastors say, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. That's not what the scripture says. Let's make sure we're reading what the word tells us this morning. Because that's not the truth. The truth is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you say, well, I don't have a heart for missions. That's okay. Put your treasure there. Oh, I know. Now, we're getting radical, aren't we? That's okay. You might say this morning, you know what? I don't have have a heart for missions. I would say to you, that's okay. Put your treasure there. Because when you put your treasure there, guess what will follow? Your heart. And so when we look at this, I mean, I want you to think about it. Think about like when you invest in a stock, right? And I don't know how many of you, and I won't do show of hands or anything, but many of us, you know, now there's a lot of ways that we individually, you know, can go online and we can invest in stocks. And so when you do, when you invest in a stock, what do you do every day after that? You go back and you look at it and you watch it. And you've got your little, you know, you put your little app up on your phone because you want to alert. You want to know if that stock is going up or down. Well, guess what? You just put your treasure in a stock. And what followed? Your heart. Your heart followed. And you're going to monitor it every day because you're going to want to see, is it going up or down? Right? You want to know, what's my ROI? What's my return on investment? You've become heart deep. I have two illustrations I want to share with you as we keep moving here. Um, I already alluded to the mission trip experience. Many people have come and they've said, they've said, man, it's really expensive. I don't know that I can afford to go. We've had a lot of people who have come to us at the beginning and have said, I can't, don't, I'm not sure if I can go. They've gone on the trip because God makes a way. And we'll, we'll help raise funds. You have no idea what God wants to do when you step out in obedience into the water. But you have to get your toes wet. So sometimes we just need to step out in obedience and say, you know what, I don't know that I can afford this. But when I step out obediently into the water, God, man, does amazing things. I've never heard anybody in my life say to me, I paid a lot of money to go on that trip, and it was really expensive. 
I really am, I'm not thankful that I did that. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. Because the truth is you put your treasure into going on that trip and then your heart went with it. And guess what got transformed all along the way? Your heart. It was made different when it came back. You see, we have an opportunity to, to recognize the difference between storing up earthly tre- treasures versus stirring up eternal treasures. Eternal treasures last for how long? Eternity. Do you remember in the 90s, uh, we had chain wallets? How many of you remember chain wallets? <clears throat> yeah, where my, where my dog's at, right? I had a chain wallet, you know, and you put it in your back pocket and it had the, it had the chain. And depending on how cool you were, it depended on how long that chain was, Right? And so, and it snapped on to your, to your belt or to your pant loop, and it was great because you never lost your wallet. And I was notorious for losing my wallet. Like my mom said one time, she said, I'm going to take that chain, I'm going to wrap it around your neck, you know. <laughs> I don't want you to lose your wallet again, right? So we had chain wallets. Can I help you understand this morning that there is an invisible line between your heart and your wallet? It might not be, a, and sometimes in some cases it is a chain, You know, but just like you could put that wallet in your back pocket and you would see that chain loop down, you knew that that chain that was attached to the wallet and that wallet was attached to the person. Folks, the challenge for us this morning is to recognize that there is an invisible line between our heart and our wallet. And God challenges us in these moments. Verse 20, when we look at Matthew 6, says, Store Your treasures in heaven. Whose treasures? Your treasures. It's the difference between earthly and eternal. We can invest in earthly things that, guess what? When the lights are out and the party is over, they stay. But what would it look like for you to recognize the eternal blessing and storing up eternal treasure? Things that will last forever. If we go back to Zacchaeus and we look at the action and the attitude of giving, the action of giving for Zacchaeus changed because he had that encounter with Jesus. Immediately, he wasn't given just a Zacchaeus perspective. He was given a kingdom perspective. Immediately, because of his interaction and encounter with Christ, he was changed. And he then lived differently and had a kingdom perspective. His attitude was changed again through the fourfold to anyone that he owed. You see, Zacchaeus' attitude about giving changed. 2 Corinthians, uh, verse, um, 2, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, For God loves a cheerful giver. How many of you have heard that before? God loves a cheerful giver. Many of us have heard that verse. Even if you didn't grow up in the church, you, you've heard that because many people probably have quoted it to you. Here's the best part. That word cheerful in the Greek is hilaros. Everybody say hilaros. What does that sound like? Hilarious. So literally what, what Paul is saying, for God loves a hilarious giver. God loves a hilarious giver. Have you ever been challenged by God with a number? And what's the first thing that you did? You laughed. Because it was funny. And then all of a sudden you go, oh wait God, you're serious. Has God ever challenged your heart in that way? I'll be honest with you, I love that when that happens. I love that when that happens. Because we have an opportunity to step out in faith and to trust God. And what he wants to do. God loves a hilarious giver. 2 Corinthians 8, and we're going to close here. 2 Corinthians 8, if you turn to page 886 in your Bible. says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. So what we're understanding right away is the churches in Macedonia are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy. Because stuff doesn't satisfy. Stuff never, ever satisfies. Or even it may give us momentary pleasure, but it'll never be eternal pleasure. 
They're being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. Now, how can a poor church be generously rich? Well, I can tell you. His name's God. (laughs) And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing and the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Now, uh, let's keep reading. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us. What have we talked about? Attitude, action. What was their first action? They gave their lives. They gave their heart. Before you can be a generous and rich giver, and when I say rich, I don't mean monetarily, because obviously we're not talking monetarily here, that they're already known to be a poor church. But in order for you to be a generous and rich giver, you first have to give your heart. You first have to submit. You first have to give him everything. So they even did more than we had hoped, right? Verse 5, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. And folks, there's a part of this that, that, that I want to just share with you, that we are so close to finishing, finishing well on our giving through Power of One. And a couple weeks ago, you heard me talk about the the Operation Christmas gift. On December 20th, we are going to receive, we do a Christmas offering every year. This isn't a surprise. This isn't a gimmick. This isn't a, you know, hey, we're going to do this. This is something that we do because we believe, we believe that God wants to, he wants us to be rich and generous givers. And, And by standards, we are definitely not a poor church. We are definitely not a poor church but we can still be rich and generous in our giving because of what the Lord has done through us. I, I just want to share with you just one, one little thing about Power of One. When you give to Power of One, it's a designated offering. Do you know what that means? In the, in the polity of the Church of the Nazarene, when you designate an offering like Power of One, it can only be used for Power of One initiatives. It's not used to keep the lights on. It's not used to keep the water running. It's not used for for any of the pastor's salaries, well, except for Pastor Xavier, because we he's we're paying him through the end of the year. And we did that because of his work in the community, because of his role in core. But it is mission and ministry dollars. It doesn't go to pay down our debt. It is designated to have kingdom impact kingdom impact. We need to raise $10,000 for Costa Rica because Pastor Tony already shared with you that we're having a meeting. Well, guess what? We have so many people that want to go to Costa Rica that we might have to take two trips. We might, I mean, could you imagine if Trinity Church in faith stepped out on the water and said, God, we believe not just in the local mission, but we believe in the global mission that you have for our church that we're going to need to raise extra funds in order to help people, in order to do, uh, we have to have uh, project funds. You know, we have to, there's things that we have to do that we, that we desire to do, but we need to raise those funds. So we need to raise an additional $10,000 for Costa Rica. We have the World Evangelism Fund. We've been supporting our missionaries around the world. The work of God in the global mission of the Church of the Nazarene is huge, And it's monumental. And the only way that it happens is because of faithful obedience of of congregations like ours. So we give to the World Evangelism Fund faithfully because we want to see God's work continue around the world. We do, well, Feed My Starving Children is coming up November 20th. But in February, I don't know if you saw the slide, there's a mobile pack. We believe in the mobile pack so much that we discount the amount for every person to go. Anybody who wants to go, we discount it 50%. We ask you to have a little skin in the game because we all know that when we have a little skin in the game, we end up taking a little bit more serious because guess what? Where our treasure is, there our heart goes with it. So if we're going to invest in Feed My Starving Children, the church is going to invest in you. So we need to raise those funds because we don't want to have to turn people away because we don't have the funds in order to support them. Hesed House. 
uh, this past time when we went to Hesed House, man, you know what? God's doing a work in Hesed House, folks. We used to be challenged to get people there in, for the midnight shift. And now, because of the faithful obedience of people, now the, the midnight shift is actually one of the popular shifts. It's like a party. I'm serious. So they're there all night long until, what is it? What time is it do you get out? One, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, Right? And, and we've, had, we've had people that have been serving, and many of you have served faithfully in Hesed House. You know what? Hesed House is not a ministry that's going away. Can we think outside the box for a second? We have ministries here with, that are happening with the church that we want to take to the next level because we believe God is ordaining that. I'm not going to go into detail right this second, but I want to tell you that it's going to take a congregation that's going to step out in faith because we're going to have to, we're going to, have to follow our treasure. Okay? We're going to have to follow our treasure in order for it to be accomplished because we believe in great things that God wants to do through Trinity. And so we need to, we need to be aware of that. We sent 1,000 backpacks two years in a row. We've sent 1,000 backpacks to the, to the kids in Martin County, Kentucky. 1,000 backpacks. Folks, the only way that we have the ability to do that is because God has richly blessed our congregation to do that. And it's because of the giving through power of one. We've been able to help people both off the street and in our congregation over the past year that have been financially struggling. And we have an incredible process, and I want to I applaud the work of our board last year as we diligently worked together to create a healthy, prog- a healthy process. See, we don't believe in toxic charity. We, the board and I, we read in the finance committee, we read the book Toxic Charity because we wanted to make sure that our charity, our giving is in line with God's heart. And so we've, we've done that. Uh, ultimately, we have an opportunity to partner with God through Power of One. And between now and December 20th, I want to challenge you, I want to challenge you to sacrificially give. This isn't tithe, okay? This is offering. Tithe is, is, the, is the word tithe means 10%. It's the first fruits. It's the first fruits of your increase, God has blessed you. You know, he's a generous God. He gives us 100% and only asks for 10 back. Everything that you've had the opportunity to receive from God is 100% given by God, and he asks for 10% back. That's tithe. This is offering. It's above that. It's sacrificial. What can you sacrifice between now and December 20th that we can trust God that we're going to hit our goal, not by February 28th, but by December 28th? How cool would that be? And again, folks, it's all mission and ministry dollars. It's designated. It will go to be the hands and the feet and the work to advancing God's kingdom around the world and starting here in our local congregation, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. So I've been challenged, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm going to give up Starbucks between now and December 20th. And I'm, and, and I'm being challenged. God's challenging me. It doesn't start, it starts with me. It starts with my heart. And God's been challenging me to be obedient. And so that's just one thing. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, that sounds a little bit like a cop-out. No, no, no. Not if you know how much Starbucks I drink. <laughs> but I'm going to give up Starbucks from now. I'm going to sacrificially give. And everything that I would spend on that, we're going to give to Power of One. That's me. That's just me. I'm not asking you. I'm not, you know, telling you what you need to do. And in fact, uh, if we keep reading in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7, it says, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. The whole reason why I even preach this message is not because I want something from you. It's because I want to give something to you. It's not about getting something from you. It's something for you. Just like God doesn't need your money. His blacktop is gold, right? But he doesn't say, I want you to give it to me because I need it. He says, I want you to give it to me because you need it. So, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, as we close. This is an important verse. You must each decide in your heart 
how much to give. This is scripture, folks. This is Paul challenging the church. He wasn't challenging just a person. He was challenging the church. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I'm a believer in that. For God loves a person who gives, who is a hilarious giver. For God loves a hilarious giver. It's the truth. It's the truth. Would you stand with me as we close? So the bottom line reminder for us this morning is God won't ask you to give. He won't ask you to give something that he hasn't given first. Amen? Amen. Let's close with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen, you are sent.